Welcome to Video Wissen and at the TH Rosenheim. We are hosting this year's conference on physics teaching and engineering education, PTEE 2024. We will have two keynotes. Today, you will see and hear the first keynote from Mieke de Kock. She is a professor of physics at KU Leuven in Belgium. Her research interest in the conceptual understanding of physics. Her keynote is about the intimate relationship between math and physics. Beautiful for physicists, but hard for students. I was asked to talk about the very beautiful relationship between math and physics, which we like as physicists, but most of our students do find it very hard. It doesn't come as a surprise to you that most of the physical phenomena can be described mathematically. This starts already with 1D kinematics, Newtonian mechanics, which we teach in high school in Belgium. Don't know whether it's all over the place there. But of course, it also applies in more uh, advanced physics topics like, uh, like thermodynamics, where we have the heat equation or the very beautiful Maxwell relations, whether they be in integral or in differential form. Mathematics is there anyway. And most of our students perceive this relation as hard. This is, for example, shown in the many coffee mugs. I'm a theoretical physicist by training, and they drink by definition too much coffee, I think. So there are these coffee mugs where students describe physics as a science using awfully complicated formula to describe very easy phenomena. And they refer to this hard relationship also in the student t-shirts we have for the physics and mathematics students in KU Leuven, where everybody asks, what's the actual meaning? What's the physics behind the Maxwell's equations? Or what's the physics behind some of the particle physics equations? So it's clear that this relationship kind of troubles students. It's also clear that most of the physicists do like the relationship. And this is shown in these uh, quotes of uh, Wigner and Feynman, who refer to the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of laws of physics, which they call a wonderful gift. Or Feynman, who states that it's impossible to understand the beauty of nature if you don't have a deep understanding of mathematics. So there is these two coins, uh, two sides of the same coin, the physicists really liking the mathematics and physics interplay while the students having trouble with them. So in this talk, I would like to focus first a little bit on the role of mathematics in physics. I tried to explain two examples. It might be that because of time issue, I only can explain one. But I would like to illustrate how research can help to interpret these difficulties. And based on these findings, I hope I can formulate some ideas in how to support the students. So let's start with this role of mathematics in physics. The role is well known. It's very old intimate relationship in, uh, in physics, where in the early days, back with the Greeks already, most physicists were mathematicians and the other way around. There was no real distinction between physics and mathematics. But of course, in Newton's Principia, it became very clear that there is a very close relationship when he talks about the Principia Mathematica to describe physical phenomena, and where he comes up not only with theory of uh, gravity, but also with calculus. Um, and then, of course, there was a debate, and I should be a bit careful in Germany, the debate with Leibniz. Um, and we finally end up with some of the notations of Leibniz, I think. Uh, but Newton certainly did a big part of the work. Now, although this relationship is very clear, we should be honest and state that using mathematics in physics is not the same as doing mathematics. Both disciplines have a different purpose. The one is a self-contained coherent system starting from some axiomas and then 
using logic and a mathematical deduction to uh, describe some of the mathematical uh, ideas. While in physics, we do want to describe the outside world and what's going on there. So the purpose is different, which makes that the use of mathematics is also different. And stated in the words of uh, Joe Reddish, we do speak a physics dialect of mathematics. Some other authors call it that we ask our students to become bilingual, both in mathematics and physics. Now, as physicists, we use math when doing physics. But we also use physics when doing math. For instance, to exclude some of the solutions of equations being at time that can't be negative. But then we really use physics insight to decide which mathematical solution is the one we are looking for. So we do it also the other way around. And that's, of course, not what mathematicians do. In describing this um, role of math in physics, I think one of the essential things is that we load physical meaning to mathematical symbols. For us, physicists, equations tell stories. If we look at this simple 1D kinematics equation, it's not just a parabola. It's not just a second degree polynomial. Every physicist will say it describes the position which is a physical uh, concept, as a function of time, where an object is moving, starting from an initial position, x0, having an initial velocity and a constant acceleration, and it describes, starting from the initial position, how the, uh, the position evolves. So there is much more in it than the second degree in the time or the parabola uh, in mathematics. So if we take this point of view, towards the use of mathematics in physics, there is much more than doing more math to help our students. We can't blame the mathematics teachers because we use mathematics in a very specific way, in the physics way of thinking, and I think it's the task of the physics teachers also to have students thinking mathematically in physics. Now, in my university, often my colleagues complain they don't know the math anymore and say we should put more mathematics courses. Well, I'm convinced that that might not be the full solution. And I try to explain you why. Of course, sometimes there is trouble with mathematics. Some students don't get the mathematics ideas true. But often we do see that students who do well in mathematics courses still focus on calculations, technical role of math or procedures, and they don't fully grasp the structural understanding which we need in physics, and sometimes they simply don't get the physics. Now, each of these problems could, of course, be a reason to have a problem with combining mathematics and physics. And mathematics and physics together becomes hard for students. So I would take the stance that we need research to try to understand what's actually going on in the physics mind in order to be able to support them during our teaching. Now, this role of mathematics in physics is an, uh, an active research field, and I just put up some uh, screenshots of the FISREF Physics Education Research uh, Journal, which is an open source journal and probably is the most uh, dedicated scientific journal focusing on physics teaching in higher education. There are some other journals focusing on physics teaching, of course, but this one particularly has a lot of information on higher education teaching of physics. And as you see, it goes all over the place from integration, um, differentials, blending mathematics and physics, and then combining the mathematics context and the physics context in order to see what's going on. And these are only some examples of the more recent last 10 year papers. Now, in these different research uh, papers, there are several lenses 
which are used to study the mathematics in physics or the use of mathematics in physics. And I only will name some of them and I won't explain them in detail, but one of them particularly we will need in the rest of the talk. So there is Bruce Sherin's symbolic forms, which kind of describes how students understand equations, how they read equations, how they see structure of equations, where one of the um, rather easy to grasp by these is, for instance, the parts of a whole form where we have this typical sum, which means that several parts contribute to one thing. And so it describes uh, both a structure of a mathematics equation in the template, the symbolic form name, and then the schema which is related to it. But it focuses on the understanding of equations. A second model uh, by Reddish and Quo, which was earlier published, but in this form, it's in the 2015 paper, where um, they describe a model for pr physics problem solving. And so what's going on there is that we have a physical system. We try to model it in a mathematical way. We process some of the mathematics and then we return to the physical system and we evaluate whether the solution of our modeling kind of aligns with the physical system we are describing. Now what's particular in this problem is that the mathematical processing is, in my interpretation, taken out a little bit of the physics. So we go to mathematics, then we do the, some internal mathematical processing and we return to the physics. And this is similar in the um, Acer framework by the colleagues of Colorado Boulder, where they talk about the activation, the construction, the execution, and the reflection, which defines the Acer. And so the activation of the tool and the construction of the model, they interplay, and then we go to the execution of the mathematics, the results, and we have to go back. So this is non-cyclic model, and they also explicitly mention that you can step in at each of the places, so it's not considered as a linear model in this case. But again, we see this execution of the mathematics being um, taken out a little bit. And it's a model also used to describe problem solving more in advanced physics. So they originally came up with the idea to describe the more advanced physics, while the Reddish and Quo model was um, basically introduced in context of introductory physics. And then the last model I would like to mention before we go to examples is the conceptual blending model or the mental space integration. This model from Fauconnier and Turner is originally a linguistic model which describes how, stu uh, how people in general make meaning when they combine inputs from what they call different mental spaces. And the example which was in the original Fauconnier and Turner paper is a very nice one, I think. It's the idea of a computer virus. Where we have the idea of a virus, which is a typical biological idea. Then you have the mental space of all of computer science. And by combining the idea of viruses and the ideas of computer science, you end up with something completely new being a computer virus. It doesn't fit in the biological space. It wasn't in the computer science space. But now it has its own meaning by blending these ideas together. And this model is uh, actually used in the physics context by now by several authors when the input space one is kind of mathematical space, the input space two is the physics space. And by combining mathematical ideas and physics ideas, we come up with a deeper understanding and some new things in the more advanced physics. So given these lenses, let's turn to two examples, maybe only one, and try to get an idea how this research can help to interpret student difficulties when using math and physics. I start with integration. So integrals play an important role in physics. They show up in many different physics contexts, for instance, in kinematics, where we use the idea of the antiderivative when we calculate displacement, starting from the definition of velocity being the derivative of the position. When we define work for non-constant forces, we start coming up with this idea of the area under the curve and the idea of the small 
rectangles to build the area under the curve. And if we turn to ENM, to electromagnetism, we use the idea of summation when we describe non-uniform charge distributions and want to compute the E field based on this non-uniform contribution. Where we split the distribution in small parts, we take the contribution of each of these parts and we sum over all these contributions. So that means in physics we use the integral sometimes as an antiderivative, sometimes area under the curve, sometimes summation. And we do want our students to know which interpretation or which use is the appropriate one at a certain time. From math education research, we know already that students that have taken calculus courses are very fluent in performing symbolic integral techniques. They can compute integrals, usually. They are fluent in calculating area under the curve in a mathematics context. But also from math education research, we know that many don't see the integral as a Riemann sum. That they have an erroneous area conception, where they think area should be positive, and then of course they get in trouble with some of the integrals where the area under the curve can be negative. And it seems there is no real conceptual understanding of the relation between integrals and areas. Now, Thompson and Seeley already mentioned that if you want to understand area under the curve in a context which is different from a real area, so for instance, when you have to understand work as area under the curve, you need to see the integral as a sum of infinitesimal parts that are formed multiplicatively. So you really need to see the structure of the integral as being a multiplication first and a sum then. Colleagues in Ireland try to get the concept image of their students at the start of an ENM course. So I don't want to go in detail on the idea of the concept image, but it's mainly the, the mental idea a student has on a certain mathematical concept. So it's a co an idea from math education research. Concept image is uh, related to concept definition, where the concept definition is the, the truly mathematical concept definition, and the concept image is the idea students have. And so what they did is they asked their students simply interpret, and that means write everything you think about when you see these two expressions. They categorized these open uh, answers of the students and they tried to give meaning to the uh, student answers. And what they found is that only very few students came up with the conceptual interpretation of these integrals. Only few of them mentioned the idea of a sum, of area under the curve or area in general, but most of them tried to evaluate the integral. And now this works with the first one, the left one, but it's very hard with the second one to, in, to evaluate. But we saw that students do interpret these things as a constant times x, and then they start integrating, and then they have x squared, and then they fill out the boundaries and so on. So heavy focus on this evaluation. Now together with Paul van Kampen from uh, Ireland, we kind of duplicate the study in, in Belgium, where we do know that our students are mathematically very well prepared as uh, most people think from high school already. And so we asked exactly the same question and we did the same categorization and maybe no surprise, but it's almost exactly the same percentages. So also the Belgian students don't come up with some area under the curve, but they heavily focus on evaluation. Now, if this is the idea with which students come in in your course in ENM, where you only focus on summation, but they don't have the idea of summation of an integral, then of course it's conflicts for the students. So all this taken into account, let's turn to uh, one of the research papers of Ngai and Rebello, where they try to see to what extent students are able to use area under the curve in physics. And so it's an interview studies. Students were given six interview problems. Um, they had to recognize certain quantity as area under the curve. And one of the examples is this one, where there is a gun uh, with the spring. And basically, the force versus distance graph is given. And students have to 
find the area under the curve in order to solve the problem. A second problem is similar. It's a friction versus angle. The difference with the, with, the for, uh, the, with the foregoing one is that it's not just simply the area under the curve, but you have to multiply afterwards with the radius of the half circle. And in the third example, or third interview question, students were asked to compute the electric field. The charge distribution was given, and they were given three graphs, all containing the charge distribution, but giving them uh, in a different way. All the graphs are correct, but which one is the useful one to compute the electric field is basically the underlying question. Now, what were the results? It turned out the students often do not spontaneously use area under the curve. While you would think that if the question is given this way, they all think about area under the curve. No, they don't. Of course, because it was a sequence of interviews, they kind of get used to the idea of area under the curve. But they were not sure what the area represents. For instance, in the second example, where you have to uh, multiply with the radius, they don't multiply, which means they just take area under the curve, but they don't know what the meaning of this area under the curve exactly is. And in the third example of the electric field, they were for sure not sure which curve to use. So still the students, they could kind of by heart state that the work equals the area under the curve for a force versus displacement graph but they could not apply it correctly, which shows that there was no real conceptual understanding of the integral area relationship. And if we look at it in terms of the Acer model, I would say that the activation of the tool was not successful. Students did not activate the idea of area under the curve. And if it was successful, the construction of the model was not completely successful because they, they didn't know exactly which mathematical model they had to take. If we think in terms of the blending ID, I think the, the mathematics probably is there in a procedural way, but the area under the curve ID is not very well understood. Probably they know work, but they can't bring both IDs together. And so the same authors, or at least Rebello is the same with another student, I guess. They did a second or another interview study where they did teaching learning interviews with introductory students, group interviews. So there were three or four students thinking together, and they analyzed the reasoning of the students with the blending model. So this is the question that the students had to solve. There is a material with length L and a cross-sectional, which is given where the resistivity varies along the rod, giving this um, exponential function. And they were asked to find the total resistance of the cylinder between the two end phases. So students discussed in groups. And what they did is they analyzed the student reasoning in terms of this blending framework, which means they came up with the input spaces and tried to see how students bring together the ideas from the input spaces. So as input spaces, they defined the symbolic space, the math concept space, or the math, notice, uh, math notion space, they call it, and the physics space. The first group of students, they, they think about uh, the symbols, the resistivity as a function of position, and they know the relation between resistance and resistivity. They think about the func uh, functions and integrals as a sum where d x or the d something is the variable of integration, which sounds reasonable, and they have the idea of resistivity, resistance, and length. So it seems that the input spaces are more or less OK. Now, what do these students do? They say resistivity varies with length, so we have to replace the R in the relation between resistance and resistivity by this relation of uh, R of x. And then we have to integrate it. Well, the variable of integration is dx, so they come up with this expression, which for sure is not correct. So it seems that the input spaces are more or less fine, but the blending goes wrong. Second example, students have the same symbolic space, physics space, but they see the D as differentiation. And so how they reason is that they 
come up with the same formula, this uh, resistance as function of resistivity, where this L kind of takes a strange role. But then they say, OK, dr is the derivative of this thing. They derive the thing, and then they start integrating. Again, the input spaces seem more or less OK, but the blending goes wrong. Happily enough, there is a group that really knows what's going on, and they divide the cylinder in small pieces. They describe the resistance of a small piece, and then they integrate correctly. So by taking this lens of the conceptual blending framework, we can identify more precisely what's going on, and we can go a step further than students can't do these problems. Of course, the same happens when we try to describe derivatives. Derivatives show up in almost all physics, be it kinematics, electromagnetism, heat transfer, and so on. Also for derivatives, we have all these different interpretations that we use. Slope, rate of change, limit of differential quotients, and of course, if we go to the more advanced mathematics, we have functions of several variables. Then we have to expand the idea of a derivative towards divergence, gradient, rotation, uh, which we all need in electromagnetism, which is highly non-trivial for students. Also here, in mathem from mathematics education, we do know that students already have some problems in uh, understanding derivatives in mathematics, where uh, some students really think that the derivative to, or in order to find the derivative graphical, they need the equation of the tangent line, or they try to find the equation of the graph before they can sketch the derivative, which again shows this focus on formula. They don't want to reason graphically. We have the well-known slope height and interval point confusions, and the confusions between amount and rate of change. So this is all for the simple derivatives. Now, it's not so hard to see that it will show up in more advanced derivatives also. I quickly go to an example of derivatives in the context of multivariable functions, where we have the heat or the diffusion equation. And one of my PhD students did an interview study with uh, 12 students that did pass a course that included the heat equation. So the, solu the, dis uh, the equation itself was discussed, but also solu uh, solution of the equation was discussed. And so we gave these students a problem in the context of the diffusion equation, where there is a tube of length L, uh, or length 1, uh, 1 meter, yeah, where there is an initial distribution given, and it's said that the, uh, the tube is closed, so there can no particles can enter or go out. And we ask the students to describe the system mathematically, which means which partial differential equation is needed, which are the boundary and the initial conditions to describe the system. We analyzed student reasoning using the blending framework. Now it showed up then the whole ID uh, and the whole um, interview that particularly the boundary conditions were hard and were an interesting instance to study the math physics interplay. So we saw difficulties both in math space, in the physics space, but also in the blending space. So to remind you, uh, if you're not teaching uh, the heat equation, I can imagine that it has been a long time. That's one of the nice things of doing PER. I really understand some of the equations which I should have understood when I was a student, but nobody asked me to explain them conceptually. So the heat equation describing the temperature distribution and how it evolves based on the Laplacian of the temperature, which is a kind of average temperature in an environment, of course, no particles can flow in and out, which means that the boundary conditions are given uh, with the derivatives with respect to the position, and they are zero. And the initial condition is um, the black one, the cos uh, one minus cosine function, and the other one are the time evolutions when the system evolves, of course. Only four out of 12 students, I remember these students, they passed a course in which the heat equation and their solutions was discussed. Only four out of 12 could come up with uh, a decent formulation of the boundary conditions. And even these students 
showed to be very, very doubtful in formulating their answers. Now, if we analyze this in terms of the blending model, we see few problems in the physics space. Some students have difficulty in uh, discriminating between concentration and number of particles, and some of them turn to temperature and heat instead of diffusion because they're more familiar with it, and then they have a, uh, don't discriminate between temperature and heat. We do see some problems in the mathematics space, and for instance, they don't discriminate between the different partial derivatives, and this shows up to be a problem in the blending space, where we do see that students kind of know that they need a boundary condition with a derivative, but they really don't know whether it should be with respect to time or with respect to position which means they, they, they know what is a partial derivative. They can explain, they can compute. They know what it means that there can no particle flow in and out, but they don't know how to describe it. And so some of these students really come up with the partial derivative with respect to time, and if they have to argue, they say, OK, there is no change, so there should be partial derivative with respect to time, which shows that they turn to this partial derivative with respect to time all the time, even if it's not appropriate. So I will skip the second part where we have students that do have complete mathematical understanding. They have the correct answer, but they still state, OK, I know it's a partial derivative with respect to position, but I can't explain and I really can't don't know why this is the correct one. So they have a correct understanding in math and physics, but they don't know why the blending is the correct one. Some students spontaneously grouped graphs, and it seems that this helps them. So we know already from earlier research that graphs can stimulate this blending. And this brings me to some of the ideas in how to support students, because we have some research, and I, I didn't show it, but also in electromagnetism, where the use of different representations can support students to gain more deep understanding of the math physics interplay relationship. So how to support students? Step one, be aware of the difficulties. They are not always mathematical difficulties. Don't blame the math colleagues all the time. Make the different interpretations of the math concepts explicit. Sometimes it's used as a summation. Sometimes it's used as an antiderivative. Sometimes the use of the area under the curve, which of course is related to the antiderivative, and of course is related to the summation idea, but not for the students. So make it explicit and discuss which interpretation is appropriate. Focus on the structural role of mathematics and on the conceptual understanding rather than on the procedures. They know the procedures most of the time. And use different representations and discuss these different representations. But this comes with uh, a cost because they have to know what the interpretation represents, what information is in there. A field vector plot is not the same as a field line diagram. There is different information, and translating from a field vector plot to a field line diagram seems to be non-trivial for students. So you have to discuss each of the representations. And honestly, in most of the textbooks, these representations show up without a lot of attendance to them. And these are typical physics representations. Field line diagrams are not that much used in ordinary differential or partial differential equation courses. Eh? Switch between the representations is important, then, and interpretation of these concepts in each of the representations. Some research, uh, which is very recent, which means last month, shows that students can't interpret partial derivatives in contour plots. They are not used to contour plots. Well, we use them in heat equations all the time, but they are never asked to derive ideas on derivatives in terms of contour plots. So discuss them. To conclude, doing math is not the same as doing math in physics. The problems can come from the math and the physics, but they often come from the blending. And there, the role of the physics teachers comes in. Because the teaching method, supporting material, including graphs, including different representations, shows to be uh, a good way of going to support students to develop 
better understanding, which means that you can make the difference as a physics teacher. Thanks a lot for your attention. So um, I, I mentioned that the supporting material can make the difference. And the question is whether the material exists, of course. And I would ask the same question. We are developing some tutorials in context of the heat equation. We do have tutorials in context of electromagnetism where support students in their understanding of divergence and um, rotation of vector fields in order to better understand the differential form of the Maxwell's equations. And they are tested and they seem to work. So there, there is one on divergence, one on uh, rotation, and one on the um, application of them in the context of the Maxwell's equation. And they, they, they were online, but I'm not sure because they changed the website. But if you send me an email, I, I can easily provide them uh, to be used. Then we did develop one on boundary conditions. It's tested a little bit, but it's not online yet. But we do have the material and the PhD student working on it right now. She is uh, developing a tutorial for student understanding of the Laplacian in the context of the heat equation and the relation uh, of the Laplacian between second partial derivatives and the sum of the second partial derivatives on the one hand, and of course the div of Grad, uh, the divergence of the gradient of the temperature field, where we do see that switching between the sum of the second partial derivatives and seeing a vector field as a divergence of the gradient of the temperature helps students in conceptual interpreting the heat equation. And so we're developing. They are developed in English because the PhD student doesn't speak Dutch. So, yeah, <laughs> they are developed in English. The talk I gave kind of gives the idea that we are now at the point of developing um, a kind of inventory. Is that uh, a diagnostic instrument to check on a larger scale than just interviews? Because then you only reach 10 students, of course. Um, to, to give teachers an idea where their students are and whether I am considering developing it. That's a question. Is that a correct interpretation, Jerry? Yeah. Yeah. An, uh, yeah. an FCI. For an FCI for um, the math physics interplay. Well, I think the math physics interplay is broader than force, <laughs> but OK. Um, I think it's a good idea, but I don't think one instrument with 20 questions will be uh, sufficient to, to diagnose all the math physics interplay. Probably there is one needed for integration. There is one needed for derivatives and maybe even a separate one for uh, multivariable functions. We are not working on it. Um, I might consider the idea. Uh, honestly, I think I'm still in the process of trying to understand what's going on before I can set up a test instrument. But uh, I love the research, but I think it's challenging to get a very precise idea on where it's going wrong. Um, because it can be all over the place. And getting insight in the blending itself seems to be very hard. So I'm not yet there. Hope to be there before I retire. <laughs> the question is um, whether we can make the difference as a physics teacher alone or whether we need the mathematics teachers to make the change that I refer to. Yeah. So I'm also involved in the teacher training course uh, for physics high school teaching. And the one thing I always say to my students is talk to your math colleagues. And I think the same goes for our uh, degrees. We have to talk to the math uh, teachers. But I think we can do quite a lot in the physics courses. Because students, they get these ideas of summation in the math courses also. And if you look in uh, standard textbooks, derivatives are introduced in terms of velocities. They are not used in terms of uh, slopes. But they, I won't say immediately, but very soon turn to calculating integrals and calculating derivatives and integrals of the most exotic functions that I never use afterwards. And uh, the particular idea is, of course, that for instance, in electromagnetism, the electric field of a charge is one of these divergent functions. In, so it's not a standard mathematical function in this point where it's interesting. So I think we can do a lot even without the math teachers, but we should talk to them for sure. 
OK, so I try to repeat the question. Um, all I talked about is highly complicated uh, advanced mathematics because we are talking about first level education. And the question is, what advice can I give, uh, can I give to colleagues teaching in the secondary uh, education, maybe even primary education, to make our li life easier? Of course, it's always nice if someone else makes our life easier. The one thing I don't want to do as a university teacher is blame the secondary school teacher. And what the Belgian secondary school teachers do is they blame the primary school teachers. And of course, in the end, it's kindergarten, which makes the whole thing messy. And so we can't um, support physics students. I don't want to, to go that direction. I do think uh, in secondary education, a lot can be done. We do have research on that also, on the math physics in the play in secondary education. And I think the same applies. Using different representations, focus on the conceptual meaning of math concepts. So what's the meaning of a derivative? Um, in the Belgian high school books, it's introduced. Then they need physics, eh, the mathematicians, because they want to introduce it as um, a limit. And they, they start from average velocity, and they turn to uh, instantaneous velocity, and then they turn to calculating. So having um, examples where this uh, conceptual idea is important, also in a math context, is one thing using the different representations, switching between the different representations. Of course, the multivariable functions, I don't know whether they show up in high school in the other countries, but in Belgium, we don't do multivariable functions in high school. We only do functions of one variable. But also contrasting, indeed, the x of t where the x is not the horizontal x, because it's in physics, it's the displacement or it's the position. So there it becomes vertical. So showing where it applies in examples and where the notation is different to make sure students do match these things can already help, I think. So one of the things in the 1D kinematics is that a, a mathematical function in Belgium is always f of x is ax plus b, or mx plus q, depending on the book. But we've always first the linear term and then the constant. In a physics book, x of t is always x naught plus v times t, which is the other way around. Simply making students aware of this already helps them to recognize the velocity as being the slope of the tangent for a linear function. So making things explicit, I think, is the one big advice I would, I would give to everybody at all levels. <laughs>